Okay, so I think we're good to go. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming. Uh, we are uh, Helen and, and Ricardo, myself, from Calabra, and we are going to talk a bit about interacting with kernel test results. So this is a continuation from uh, one of the, some of the topics we already presented in Plumbers last year about uh, kernel results and kernel CI in particular. So uh, yesterday there was a presentation by uh, Dan Sikus and Gustavo Padovan about the kernel CI project uh, where they gave an overview of the project and uh, its current status. And today we're going to go into a bit more detail over uh, a number of talks. So uh, the project has uh, changed quite a bit since last year. One of the main differences is uh, yeah, one of the main differences is that uh, uh, KCADB now has a more prominent role as the final destination for all test results and um, kernel builds results. And that means that we are targeting, well, we are using it as our source of data now instead of uh, using the intermediate uh, data that we have that we had in kernel CI before. So this is, uh, we're going to show some examples of how that applies to kernel, um, sorry, to test results. So Helen is going to talk a bit about uh, the overall data flow and about identifying and managing test errors. And then I'm going to propose and show some ideas on uh, data analysis and automatic error detection. So, or yours. So uh, kernel CI data flow. So let's first review uh, how it works. Uh, so let's start with uh, the Maestro. Uh, so Maestro is a test orchestrator um, responsible for watching the trees, doing the builds, uh, executing the tests, and um, submitting test results to KCIDB. So just to, uh, so you can have an idea in a given day, Maestro was able to uh, do seven checkouts, more than 100 builds, builds and more than 30,000 tests. Um, and our resources are currently underutilized. So if you want to register your tree, uh, let us know. Uh, if you want to add your test suite inside Maestro, let us know. Uh, we can add it there. So Maestro sends all the information about checkouts and build tests to KCIDB, as Ricardo mentioned. And you can actually view these results through, um, oh, before that. So uh, in Maestro, we have some sort of noise detection, which means that uh, Maestro is, will try to check if uh, the error was an infrastructure error or if it's an error in the kernel itself. So if the network goes down, for instance, it's probably an infrastructure error. Um, so it sends this information as well uh, to KCIDB. And then we can view all these results through um, our official dashboard that was very recently released. You can go there right now, dashboard.kernelci.org, uh, to check. But uh, this dashboard mean, um, is meant to, so you can check the data like, as a general view, but if you need specific views, we have a Grafana instance of it. Uh, I will show you more about Grafana in a few slides uh, later. And you can also um, query the results with a few command line tools as well. Also, we, inside KCIDB, we have a post-processing part that depends on the rules. Uh, we can submit email notifications uh, to people. Right, so since we have a lot of data there, we need some sort of triaging um, mechanism. Uh, so we, we decided to start very simple. We decided to start with a manual uh, triaging. So let's say you have, you are, uh, is watching a given tree and you have a hundred of failures that you need to analyze. So uh, the first idea was, okay, let's try to tag the errors there. Uh, let's uh, 
check the first logs of the first failure and okay, this is issue one, the next one is also issue one, it's the same uh, error, the next one is, okay, it's a new thing, issue two, and then issue one again, oh, and the next one is a new thing, issue three, um, and so on. So uh, we have tools for that. So we have a user a UI where you can create these tags, which is in a kernel CI, in KCIDB vocabulary, we call issues. So we, you create this class of issue, you describe the problem, and then the act of attaching uh, a given error, a given test result with the issue, we call as uh, reporting an incident to that issue. So we, you manually do that, uh, and through our web interface, uh, and you attach. But the problem with that is the next day, you get another hundred of tests and you need to do all over again uh, to classify your data. So what we thought is, okay, when you create an issue, you can um, add a pattern there. Let's say a regex, uh, all the tests with this given string or error in the logs, uh, I want it to be automatically attached to this issue. Uh, so KCIDB can do it for you. It will automatically um, attach uh, new errors coming from Maestro or coming from other CI system uh, to it. Just a note, uh, here in my presentation, I'm focusing on Maestro because Maestro is the CI that is currently um, maintained by the kernel CI um, community, but we could have also other kinds of origins, other people also submitting uh, their results to kernel CIDB. So once we have this automated process of classifying uh, the errors to known issues, we can go even further. We could um, automatically create the issues. And this is a bit, uh, is, this is related to what uh, Ricardo will present. Um, after. So uh, this is the, how the web dashboard current look like. If you go to the website, it was presented uh, yesterday by, uh, by Gustavo in his talk. Uh, you can uh, check per branch and per tree. You can check the number of failures, the passes, and click on those to check more details uh, until you get to the test and check the logs. And here is one example of one of the Grafana dashboards. So Grafana is a platform where you can build different dashboards and query directly from the database and you can create a specific panel. So it's very easy to build something there. So let's say that you don't, uh, th this dashboard doesn't um, show the information that you want. So we can go quickly in the Grafana and sketch something for you. So you can uh, hack there and create your own dashboard or come to talk to us and we can uh, put something up very quickly for you. Uh, this is one example of uh, email report. I know it's small, but uh, the email reports are also very uh, specific and custom. So we have a rule, for instance, for the codex people. Uh, they are following test results on a given tree and also uh, for a given test suites. So we submit them uh, information uh, about those, those uh, test suites that they, they are interested in. So the number of passes, the number of errors, and a link if they want to check more details, for instance. Uh, so, and this is how our great web interface looks like. Um, it's very modern, I know. Um, so you can create the, the issues on the top, uh, which is the, the tag that I, I mentioned about. And in the bottom, you can say, okay, now associate this, this error with this issue. You put the issue ID and you paste the list of test ID there and you submit and uh, it will be in the um, uh, KCIDB and you'll be able to check with in the web interface and with Grafana, I will show you how. Um, so uh, issues, so this is uh, one screenshot uh, uh, how issues look like in the Grafana dashboard. Uh, we can see the issue title, like the, the would be like the tag name, the title there. Uh, we can see the number of incidents we have to that issue. Uh, we can see who reported that. 
And when we look at the list of tests, uh, so each line here is a given test result that was submitted to KCIDB. We can check the status there. Uh, we can also uh, check the ID. So if you click on that, you can see more details, check which compiler, which uh, architecture it was, and the log of that specific error. Uh, and the interesting part is the last column there that you can see if that specific error is already attached to a known issue or not. So if you check those that uh, are empty, it means that those are not classified yet. So uh, it means that they are new things that you probably need to go and analyze. Um, so uh, some problems there. Um, the noise detection from the, the Maestro side or in any CI system that is submitting the data can be misleading. Um, it's a bit hard to detect uh, which, uh, which of the errors is um, an infrastructure failure or not. And uh, the post-processing noise detection can also be a bit hard. Uh, and we also need to understand when to send notifications, uh, understand which kind of data to show. So our goal here is to provide you data, you can do something about it, you can act on, uh, so we want to clean this up and show you something um, with, with value. So I, I had several questions, but I actually the biggest question here is, are there smarter ways to filter noise, uh, to filter the data that really interests you? Uh, so if you have other ideas I'm open to discuss. I was discussing with um, another person yesterday regarding doing some machine learning maybe. Um, so this is the current proposed model. So if you have any ideas, I'm happy to hear about. So um, about filtering uh, like the noise, so I think one problem that we've seen like in the past on the coronal CI reports was that sometimes you would have a lot of false positives and it is sometimes then a bit hard to understand like which of the reports are actually relevant for you or not. And so uh, when you create those issues, is there maybe a way to say certain issues are like basically on my like whitelist, I don't care about them and like yeah, so have you thought about something like that? Uh, yes. The, well, the idea that I had is, was uh, like the, um, to be able to subscribe or unsubscribe to the issues, but yet you will need to check each issue individually. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how to do it more automatically. Um, yeah, so this is a, a problem that we need to understand better. I mean, if we talk about false positives, you probably can't do it automatically because someone has to identify that that is a false positive first. But um, yeah, maybe just to... So, um, well, what happens, I think, is that you get a test case that gets a lot of false positives. So if you could like, uh, opt out on an individual ca test case name, right? And you see a bunch of people opting out on that, maybe that tells you you need to go look at the test and fix the test. Mm. Yeah. So I guess uh, my, my assertion would be uh, let people opt out at individual test case uh, granularity. That's exactly the case like of the device testing stuff. Like oh, we were seeing a lot of uh, flakiness and then okay, let's write a test for it. Let's write a better test. Okay, so we'll move to the next part. Thank you. Uh, okay, so data analysis and automation. Um, this is a topic that we touched upon um, plumbers last year as well. And it has to do with the fact that we have this massive amount of uh, test results information and kernel build information in case ADB. And uh, that's good on its own because we can do a lot of stuff with it. We can browse it and generate reports from it. 
but there must be a lot of uh, information hidden uh, down there that's not readily available for us to use unless we do some kind of processing or analysis on it to digest it and kind of extract <coughs> that hidden information. So um, in other words, what we want to do is to use the data we have already to extract information from it and then use that information to automate the processing of additional data. So uh, there are, of course, must be like a million ways to do this. Uh, this is an open problem. It's by no means a well-defined problem at all. But uh, like the first use case we thought about was and probably one of the most interesting ones is um, to be able to characterize uh, known error information and to use that information to automatic to be able to perform automatic matching in the new results that we get. So in theory, if we are able to do this, there are new features that we get that we didn't have before, such as uh, the possibility of classifying errors by type, uh, provide new uh, enhancements and possibilities for queries in the database, and probably find patterns as well. So how are we doing this for now? Um, well, I think the, the main idea is that if we can find a way to automatically profile an error, and by profiling, I mean uh, to be able to uniquely identify an error type, uh, then we have a way to compare errors together and match them against each other. So uh, we wrote a very simple proof of concept, a very simple tool, which is basically a, a context-sensitive parser for logs, and uh, we'll see how it works in a while. And the question is, where are we getting this information from? Uh, right now, build logs and test logs, right? including uh, kernel boot logs, and etc. So this is far from ideal, and we are aware of that. In an ideal world, we would get that information straight away from the kernel or from the tools in a, in a uh, well-specified way and a structured way, so we can just put it in the database and, and uh, use it directly. And I know that uh, GCC, for example, can uh, provide the uh, error information as a JSON object instead of just as a uh, regular standard error output. But that's a particular case for a tool. We don't have anything like that for the kernel. Each test may, give, uh, may provide the output in a different way, even though there are standards and there's KTAP and all that. Uh, but we are not there yet. So this is just an experiment to see how far we can get with just logs. So the way we are doing it is, well, this tool and the associated scripts basically take a, a log output, which is basically what we have right now in KCDB, a large number of results and a large number of uh, pointers to logs, and uh, do some specific uh, parsing depending on the case, depending on the type of log. If we find an error, something that looks like an error in a kind of a structured way, we uh, turn that into structured data and then we get a signature for that. The signature in this case may be just a hash. And then submit that automatically as an issue in KCADP so we can have it as a reference. What we gain this way is once we reach that point, we can now use that structured data to uh, do specific queries that we couldn't do before without it. And we can use the signatures, these kind of uh, unique identifiers, to match new uh, test results with the issues that we have already in the database automatically. So here's a simple example. This is a fragment of a uh, UBSAN. I don't know if the people at the, uh, the bottom can see it. But this is an example output from a UBSAN as you would find it in a kernel log. And this is what the tool we get from that, which is it has a uh, something like an extractor is not standard at all, it's just an experiment. But it will tell you this is this kind of error, and this is a summary, and it happens in this file, in this hardware, et cetera. So you can extract a kind of signature for this particular instance of that error. Um, and then you can link all the um, test results where that error happens uh, all across the database automatically. This is uh, an example using the Grafana dashboard that uh, Helen shown before. Different example, this is with the uh, kernel build, a compiler error, but it's actually a warning that's considered an error because of the minus W error flag. 
and this is what the tool would get from it. Uh, again, a summary of it. Uh, type of error in this file, this was the target file and in that make file script. So as much as you can get uh, just by parsing using silly regular expression from, from the log. Uh, this is just another example of uh, another kind of, uh, this is a kernel warning, and this shows how we find logs normally, which are not always clean, sometimes with a lot of uh, lines, unrelated lines in between. If you're careful enough, you can kind of write a parser that uh, is robust enough to uh, be able to parse that into something useful. Again, this is all best effort. It's very fragile. If the uh, format of the reports, of the reports change, uh, this will break, so you have to maintain the parser. So uh, again, just a, a way to showcase an idea rather than a final solution. Uh, but the good thing is that once we have that into the database, now you uh, have something for free, which is the ability to do queries that you couldn't do before. So we can still uh, perform this kind of queries like give me all the tests that fail in this kernel version for this tree and branch, for this kind of hardware, etc. But now we can say things like give me all the errors that were kernel warnings in this source file, for instance. And from that, you can tell, now give me all the tests that failed and contained that error, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, I'm sure there are many other ways to apply the same principle to other type of functionalities, but it's just like the, the first, first example that we came about. And that's pretty much it. Um, any feedback that you have is more than welcome. Um, there are open questions about how to integrate these into the workflow and how would you like to use this kind of stuff? Or what other tools would you like to have integrated? And I think I have a question over there. Okay, so uh, I might sound like a broken record a bit, but like, what I uh, talked about at like race talk uh, with like the thing of uh, doing the parsing of like the errors and the warnings of the build log in the kernel. Um, like, especially as you said, for example, when the format changes, then you have to like maintain the, the parser that you have there so that it works again because it breaks easily. So I feel like the natural location like for now seems to be the kernel so that you have that parser in the kernel because then in, if the format changes you know yeah the parser is in the same tree um, and then obviously as you said like the like not obviously but what David basically told me is that uh, the best location is that we get the errors directly from GCC or from CLang then basically and so um, but I suppose that will probably take a while until we have the proper GCC for, uh, uh, version then for the kernel. So in the meantime, I feel like the, the right location should be the kernel instead of doing that in user space. Yeah, and so any thoughts on that? Uh, I totally agree. I mean, uh, the, the, the issue, in my opinion, should be addressed right at the source. I mean, the kernel has the information about the errors. Uh, it's only a matter of choice how you provide that information. So uh, I don't know if there is any initiative to provide it, uh, a standard interface to publish that information for other tools to consume. But in my opinion, that should be the way to go. Until we get to that point, we have to rely on logs. Yeah, and so basically uh, the, the, the reason why you choose to do that first in user space now for this experience was basically convenience for now. Uh, I choose to do it that way just because it was the easiest way to hack something to have a proof of concept. Not, get that, get not that, necessarily get because it's the best solution that we can find so far. So okay. just a test. Yeah, and I think the, the, the following question would then probably be like, okay, so you could get the, the, the build warnings and errors a bit easier if you do that directly in the kernel. And then the question following that would be then how you handle like the warnings and like the panics. Um, I, I assume it might be possible to, to store that also as a kind of JSON when it happens. I'm not sure, maybe someone has like an idea on that. I think, 
I think someone else can, can give an answer to that. I don't have it. I want to see JSON and oopses. So, I mean, I'd rather human readable. And if you want to, if you want to regularize the error output in the kernel, I think that's great. Uh, but I still think uh, just getting it from the logs is the best, best way forward. Because uh, as, a, as a kernel developer, I want human readable is more important to me for the moment. Right. But so. I don't think they are mutually exclusive. I mean, you can still yeah, have the logs it, and then provide. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to, if you have, if you have enough uh, oomph left in the kernel to also emit the JSON after the oops, that's fine. <laughs> but, but oops first. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry if I, I'm plugging a little bit here. So when you said the other CI systems can send their data too, they're actually sending. There is about eight, except Maestro. Well, seven, eight. I don't remember. It keeps changing sometimes. So there are systems sending data into KCIDB right now, uh, and in total we get like um, quite a bit of test results. I'm not going to lie, like maybe a million per day test results. Uh, <clears throat> and also when Helen said that we have Grafana, we actually have three, <laughs> three Grafanas, and we keep working and trying to converge on something that uh, satisfy, satisfies all of us. And yeah, if you're interested in any piece of data that we can have in uh, KCITB, come to us. We'll make you a little dashboard for your specifications or give you our little folder where you can play around with it and get your data. Uh, regarding issues, uh, Red Hat also sends issues, and they have different workflow. They have an army of QE people who look after the test results and then submit issues in our internal systems, and they describe how to find them in which log files, et cetera, et cetera. And these issues are submitted to KCIDB in, in a reduced shape right now, but also the incidents. So you can go to a test result and see which issues appeared in this test result. You can go to a revision to see which issues appeared in a revision specifically or in the build, etc. And from the issue you can, itself, you can see which test results were affected. And uh, we also have issues for builds as well. So if there is some particular build issue that you don't want, for example, kernel developers to be bothered about, you can say, this is, a, this is an issue and um, ignore this failure. Something like that. Yeah, that's all. Yes? Uh, uh, Just a quick question. Uh, how long do you expect to keep the test logs and test reports in KCIDB? I, th I think this might be a question for Nicola. So uh, we are preparing to have some sort of uh, service level agreement with that, we have like some beginnings of the system for caching those test results and uh, the, the artifacts. And we'll have to come up with some rules that are more or less easy to explain, but the plan is to maintain a certain length of time, particular files, etc. Not only to provide the, you with the possibility of downloading them, but because we need to use them for triaging, the same thing, uh, and retriaging. For example, an issue has changed, we have to retriage it. So yes, there's going to be an archive. At the moment, we have a test system running which archives every 256 file. And if it's un under 5 megabytes, otherwise, if it's not cached, it will send you to original URL for now. So it's on, to, on to CI, particular CI system at the moment to keep the files. But yes, we plan to store them. Uh, that, that, that's actually another um, good reason to do the processing, so we can extract what we need from the logs and then forget about it and keep the, the important parts. Yeah, this, this is also possible. We can keep those pieces of logs in the database. When we have a field called log excerpt where you can put the most relevant piece of log when reporting the issue and that's kept in the database. Yes. Yeah, on Hel Helen's question about uh, filtering noise, um, I think there will be different categories for for the noise itself. Uh, but I thought one thing that we see on our side is uh, cases where the test didn't even run because there was system failure or some, some type of instability in a test. Uh, and so if you require that the test follow some structure and you know indicate clearly their start and the end, then the, the you could filter the ones that 
don't contain those starts and the ends, and therefore, you know, those would become part of that noise. I'm sure there are other sources for the noise, but, you know, some of that will be clear. Yeah, thank you for the talk. In terms of that signature, uh, looks like it's kind of a hash. I mean, from those, I mean, di I mean, different uh, data. I mean, you were showing earlier. Uh, shouldn't it be? I mean, more coming from some minimum logs. I mean, it seems to me that there are too much information in the. I mean, how you're getting the hash. So I think it's very likely that it and it will end it up with a lot of different signature, which is actually pointing to the same issues and so on. Right, that, that's a good point. It depends on, I mean, at, in the end, you have to decide which fields you need for each kind of error, uh, because there's this balance about being overly specific and having a, a large number of different issues, or being not enough specific and losing information. That, that's something to analyze on a case per case basis. Basically, that's what I did. I'm taking like three different cases, like uh, uh, KBL failures, uh, kernel failures during boot, and that's about it. And trying to be as, as specific as possible. But uh, thank you. But yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. And this is something to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. So isn't isn't Sysbot doing some of the in terms of their collection of tracing? Like I thought there was a I thought they had a thing already that could take crash dumps and kind of get a sense of which types of crashes are kind of similar and categorize them into buckets. And and surely like people that are shipping Linux commercially, I know Android, Chromebooks and all those, they're collecting crash dumps from the field all the time and doing some sort of analysis. Like so it seems like there's gotta be plenty of overlap in commercial offerings that are already doing this that we should be sharing. But I know Sysbot at least is doing some of this. I just don't know exactly how. So. I think they just look at the first line that kind of sanitize it likely. This one looks much nicer than what they have. So uh, I'll try to be quick. Yes, uh, Sysbot does that. They do a very good job identifying it. They have their own magic. Uh, and Dmitry was here. I don't know. He's not. He's not here in the in the in the room. But he's at the conference. You can go and ask him. But there are many ways to to do this. I suppose at Red Hat there is a person who is doing it with machine learning tools, identifying the clusters and everything, grouping them. And we are going to be using that. Perhaps we'll, we'll try to, to deploy that. Uh, but if you have your own ideas of how to extract issues, how to identify them, etc., you're welcome to join and deploy your own, you know, extractor. So the database is open to like different ways of extracting this information as long as we can express it in the schema. Like uh, Ricardo worked on one way, we can do have another way, and there is namespacing in the database. So you can have your own ideas, your own playground. You you need to you can do your own hashing, yes, uh, it's, hashing is difficult, but like the only, only the person who makes the parser and extractor can decide like what goes into the hash because they know how it behaves and that's where it comes from. So it, it, it depends, right? So if anybody has any wild ideas or not so wild ideas, if you want to parse logs or whatever, come over, we'll plug you in and we'll just have to clearly mark where it's coming from so people can use that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Okay. Just a quick, uh, I'll, I'll second the plug. So at least KCIDB, you've got a whole bunch of logs that you can test your parsers on. <laughs> so. yeah. Okay, I th think we are over time now. Thanks a lot.